I'm very excited today to introduce Sonia Schwober and our special guest, Sean Strobel, her husband. Sonia and Sean have um, founded the community-supported fishery, Skipper Autos, in 2008, uh, which has been growing ever since and gaining more influence and importance in BC's fisheries. Uh, Sonia used to be a high school teacher and decided recently to dedicate her full time to Skipper Autos and uh, will explain today what this is all about. So I'm not going to give you too many details now. And um, her talk about um, <laughs> the community supported fishery movement is changing how the community supported fishery movement is changing commercial fishing in BC. So thanks for coming and please join me in welcoming the sports. fishing in BC back in the 1960s and Sean started fishing with his dad when he was seven years old and so back then fishing in BC was pretty different from how it is now you a lot of you may know um, a lot about fishing but back in, in these days there were still thousands of independent fishing families like this fishing in pretty typically sustainable small-scale ways on the BC coast so when Sean graduated a little embarrassing to talk about you in front of you, but when, when he graduated from high school, he kind of saw this as his future. He was going to carry on fishing in the family fishery. But by then, things had already changed quite a bit. And as he looked around, he could see that there were just a few old men still in fishing. Uh, there wasn't much of a future. Um, so he went to university, and he actually did his master's thesis, um, kind of exploring. He got his snickers about it. But he started exploring a little bit about uh, labor and history of fishing and fishing movement. He can talk to you more about that later. But what we what he looked at and what we looked at is that this is what fishing has become. And so it's mostly consolidation of licenses into large scale same fleet. Not mostly, that's some of it. But mostly it's this. Mo mostly now the fishing industry in BC is open pen aquaculture. And that's changed uh, it's changed the labor, it's changed communities ecosystems. So it's a completely different world from what it was sort of 1970s and before. And again, a lot of you know this stuff. This isn't a surprise. But this is or the result of the industrialization of fishing is that this is the path that you know pretty typically your seafood takes to get to you. And it may change hands 10 or 20 times. It may travel the globe not swimming uh, to get to you. Um, and every chance along the way that changes hands, there's opportunities for quality to go down, for costs to go up, for costs to go to somebody else besides the people who are really working on the ground. And there's other problems with industrialization in seafood. I mean, industrialization in the food, um, the food system in general is problematic, but it's sort of the same stuff that translates to fishing. I don't know if you know about some of these studies around mislabeling that were done. And so, you know, this was a study by the Boston Globe where roughly half <laughs> of the seafood in the stores and sushi restaurants is mislabeled. So there's really no transparency in that industrial system. You don't know what you're getting. Um, generally, it's not what it says it is. But as you know, there's a rise in this popularity of, uh, or, you know, people wanting to know where their food comes from. 
right? Sort of this food movement. People want to know where it comes from. They want to know that it's sustainable. They want to know that it's ethical. And so there's been the growth in sort of high-end fish stores like this. So it's not that it's not possible for you to get, you know, sustainable, uh, you know, fairly your own, sustainable food uh, or local food. But even in these high-end fish stores, there's still a missing piece in the transparency. You don't actually know who caught it, and you don't know if it's fair trade. You don't know if the fishermen was paid fairly. In most cases, they're not. <coughs> so that's where we come along. So Sean and I had a vision to really take out those sections of the seafood supply chain and connect independent small-scale fishermen through us, a fishing family, directly to you conscientious consumers, people who want to know where their fish comes from. So we just cut out those huge swaths of the supply chain. And so by doing that, we can change the distribution of the value of that seafood quite dramatically, I think. So let's take a look here. This is some statistics that I generated from July this 2014. And I looked at sockeye salmon and what the grounds price was for sockeye salmon this year. Uh, so if you were not selling to us, but if you were a fisherman and you were selling to the buyer, the company. So of every dollar that you would have spent if you went into uh, a regular fish store and, and the seafood was actually local, um, 25 cents would have gone to the fisherman of that dollar at the highest end, the, at the best point in the summer. The rest of it, where did it go? Right, that we don't know. If you walk into the high-end fish store or uh, into a grocery store, they can't tell you where that seafood comes from. I went into a store once recently, they had um, last spring and they had sockeye salmon in, I think it was March. And uh, he said, fresh. And I said, that's really interesting because <laughs> it's March. And he said, yeah, no, but it's fresh. I said, you mean previously frozen. No, 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 it's, it's fresh. I said, really, it's so interesting. So where is it coming from? Uh, oh, where's this fish from? And he says, it's a skia. I'm like, because that because that's going to open in July, so, so but it's March now. And they were like, uh, just going to take this away over here. And I said, where did you get this fish? And he said, I don't know, a guy with a truck showed up. Mm. And this is not going to name where, but this is a pretty high-end store. You don't know where it goes, comes from. And you certainly don't know where the money's going. But so that's what's different about Skipper Auto is what we do. So I can tell you exactly where every dollar went. And our members do hear that. So the very dollar that was spent by our members this summer in July on a whole sockeye salmon, um, fully 50% went to the fishermen. And 30% was operating costs, 10% was transportation, 10% was processing, which is all done here in Richmond, um, hand cut by one of our small scale independent processors. So it's pretty different distribution. You actually know where every penny of that goes. But I think this is even more interesting. Because people think often that that means with skip products they're going to pay more for their fish, but they don't. So this summer, if you went to that store that I used the example from, you were paying $12 a pound for whole fresh sockeye. And the fishermen at the highest rate this summer were paid $3 a pound for sockeye salmon. But uh, from us, the members were paying $7.95 a pound, and the fishermen were getting $4 a pound. So I, th I think it's a pretty huge difference. Right, so really what are we in, in kind of in the business of doing is we're in the business of keeping independent small scale fishermen fishing. And just, we use the word fishermen for men and women, I wanted to make that point. Often people say fishers, they say fishermen, but fishermen themselves, whether women or men, generally call themselves fishermen. So no offense, anyone, I'm not cutting myself as a fisherman. Um, so we keep small scale independent fishermen fishing. Um, we support their small scale practices that are we pay them a fair price for their fish, and then we connect consumers directly to that high-quality, fair-trade fish. Right, there she is, the happy consumer. So <laughs> let me explain a little bit how we do that. So in our model, members join before the fishing season starts, and they pay up front for a share in the catch. So you choose, for example, a $200 share. And so then that becomes a credit in the system. And throughout the fishing season, members get uh, weekly email updates to say what's being caught, where, by whom, and when they have the opportunity to pick it up. Then members can choose to come to as many or as few of those pickup opportunities as they like. 
they can pick whatever they want, and then the dollar value is just subtracted from your credit in the system. So it allows flexibility for the customer. They don't have to get a weekly box that, you know, if you're away on vacation, you don't want, and you're not going to be there to collect your fish. You can pick what you want, when you want, where you want, but by paying up front, we can afford to give that money to the fishermen up front to help them offsetting those high upfront costs of every season and guarantee them that they're going to get a fair price for whatever they catch, for whatever is sustainable that season. So if it's pink salmon, we're going to buy the pink salmon. Um, in the conventional supply chain, if the market doesn't want pink salmon and you're stuck with it, you're going to get pennies a pound and you're not even going to pay off your expenses. So. Okay, so a little bit about our growth. So Anna mentioned that we started 2008, we got going. So 2009, the fishing season was our first year. We had 40 members and we supported two independent fishermen. And really, Sean and I, as Anna mentioned, were high school teachers, so this wasn't supposed to be a business. This was just this thing we were doing to help keep his staff fishing. And um, so we weren't trying to grow. And then the next year, it was just word of mouth, and all of a sudden, this kind of happened. We had 200 people the next year. And we were like, oh, we've got some more fish here. But that wasn't a problem either, because the fishermen who knew we were paying a higher price on the grounds who were Otto's friends, uh, you know, were knocking on our door asking if they could join and fish for us too. And so we just kept saying yes and grew and grew. Um, 2013, we had 750 members, and last year we had 1,200 members. There's definitely a demand from both the fishermen's side and from the customers. But just to look a little bit at what the impact of that is on fishermen, and there are two of my favorites, that's Otto, and that's our son, Oliver, who's sick started fishing this year, desperate to go fishing. I think he snuck out, basically. <laughs> Caught him leaving at 5 a.m. and was like, you have to take me. And so he, so he is now a fisherman as well. Anyway, <clears throat> so just taking a look at three of our fishermen, Rod, Inky, and Otto, um, in July of this year, of 2014, um, what they would have made if they sold their exact catch to the on the grounds uh, company for the grounds price. So this is what they would have made, each of them, for what they actually caught. And then this is what they did actually make by selling to us. Gross. Gross. <laughs> no, sorry, yeah, this is not in their pockets. <laughs> I wish we were getting rich or anything. But this is what they made, and this is what they grossed. And so it's a pretty significant difference. Really, it's the difference between getting to the end of the fishing season and needing to do some repairs on your engine and being able to do that and stay in fishing for another season or getting to the end of the season, being totally broke to begin with, having a line of credit, and then having your engine go. And that's the end of it. And that's, you know, that's one less independent fisherman on the coast. That's a pretty typical story. So it's not all sunshine and roses either. I don't want to paint that kind of picture, because there are a lot of challenges. And we're working on a whole array of different solutions out there. And so Sean came to join us, and I thought it would be good for him to actually pop up and talk a little bit about the challenges, particularly from the on-the-grounds side, from the fisherman side, um, and what some of those solutions are that we're working on as well. Yeah, does that uh, sound good? Since I'm sitting here anyway, I, uh, yeah, I'll take a look. Um, so the challenges that we're facing, I mean, Sonia told you about how uh, all the, the great opportunities and how there's the, all the interest and, and uh, there's demand on both sides, demand and supply, which is great. So we're basically logistics in the middle. Um, part of the problem is, is um, okay, inputs such as ice availability. Um, traditionally, fishermen have relied on their fishing companies to supply them with ice. Uh, it's a little more difficult for us to do that and source. There really aren't that many um, facilities to provide services for people that are working independent of large companies. Now that's been a problem for a long time. Uh, the trolling fleet has dealt with that. There's been more independence for years and we're trying to learn some things from them. Of course, the, uh, we're mostly gill netting for salmon. We also have long liners. Uh, we do have a tuna trawler, uh, but that's frozen at sea. So we're sort of going, going that way to deal with those type of things. Uh, transport is always uh, difficult something to deal with, um, transporting fish uh, down this coast. It is um, quite a bit cheaper for us to ship fish from Vancouver to Calgary than it is to get it here from the island or you know, down from Prince Rupert or wherever we happen to be fishing. Um, 
But that's that's uh, part of the nature of our coast. Here, when we get to monitoring, offloading, and uh, regulation, is where we really actually encounter some significant hurdles in our growth and just uh, and um, independent fishing. <coughs> to begin with. Um, start with uh, well, it ties in actually pretty directly. Um, as I'm sure most people know here, um, the enforcement end of the Department of Fisheries and, and uh, has been greatly downsized. And you know, that's, that's an understatement, but uh, that doesn't mean that there's not monitoring. The costs for monitoring and programs are offloaded onto the fishermen in general. So a couple of years ago, well, a number of years now, we've all had to buy log books. In addition to the to the fish slips that you're you know that are filled out whenever you sell or sell catch, that get submitted weekly to the Department of Fisheries, we also have to have log books, um, which are purchased at three hundred dollars a piece per area you fish from archipelago <coughs> research or one of depending who's got the contract, um, or an electronic log, which was obviously designed by someone that never thought of the areas of the coast don't have cell access and you cannot upload, despite the fact that the regulations say they must be uploaded you know, within 24 hours of finished fishing and you're sitting in Zabellos, and the nearest cell signal is a two hour drive away. So anyways, these are a few, um, few difficulties, but a big one that's come in that's actually almost legislating us, well, I'll, I'll just explain the circumstance. Um, in the northern area for, uh, for salmon gilding, a few years ago, there was a, a new contract went out to, to an observer for offloading, custom offloading, or not custom offloading, but for offload observers. And the deal was worked out with between the Department of Fisheries, the, 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 um, the contractor, and the fishing companies that any fish caught in the northern area on the Skeena and the Nass River would be unloaded at one of their locations. So if I want to sell fish to you, if you're members of the community supported fishery and you want my fish, in fact, you already own them, you've purchased them before I went fishing, I am not allowed to go to Port Ed, to the uh, Port Edward, to the nicely uh, newly built unloading dock. We're not allowed to unload there. We have to unload to a company packer or a company offload site. Uh, if I want to sell them myself, I have to talk somebody into letting me offload onto them, onto their boat, and put them back on my boat. Uh, or you go to one of the offload, pay for custom offloading. But that actually forces me to pay thousands of dollars a year to the large fishing companies that I'm trying to be independent of. Because the legislation was actually written up in the offices of the large fishing company in, in conjunction with the fishing company. So this year they didn't actually charge us the monitoring fee, the year before it was five cents a pound for sockeye on the, the fishermen, uh, three cents for pinks. Or three cents for chum and pinks were free, I, I don't remember exactly. This year they didn't charge that, but I'm still forced to pay for custom offloading in one of the large companies. And if they're busy and they don't want to offload us, I, I don't really know what to do. Um, there are people straight out ignoring it. We've been in compliance, but I know another fishing family that converted one of their gill netters to a freezer boat. Um, and then you know, father and son will fish, and then they will got all their fish and freeze them on board, store them in, the, in their boat, and then run down here. Technically, that's illegal because you have to offload at another site, even though they want to just catch their fish and take them to the Steveston Public Fish Sales Float. That is now not legal in certain areas. I actually called up the you know the number you know that said call for information when we got this notice, and the answer was, oh, um, we hadn't really thought of that. That's the answer. We, we hadn't thought of that. We weren't thinking about anybody selling their fish directly. So these are some of the, um, a little bit of the, uh, an, an example. Uh, another example of uh, things that make a challenge for uh, doing things on a smaller scale like we are. Um, another example of monitoring, which I'm sure you're, you're all very well aware of, is our camera system for monitoring a long line in the, uh, you know, long line salmon seems to work quite well, but we of course pay monitoring costs to have someone watch the video of you fishing. Um, the camera system was designed with certain types of fishing in mind, particularly long lining uh, with hydraulics, pulling your gear, it records, you know, it's about $10,000 for the cameras, although you can lease them. But then you pay, it, they record when your hydraulics are going, you're pulling the fish, it's recording. 
Well, what that's done is made it pretty impossible for me to go handline. Now, I have a friend, we, we fish together on herring. He's got a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, lingcod coral. And we would like to go out like we always did and just go hand lining for lingcod in an area where we know we're not going to catch halibut. We can go in with the rock piles and um, fish in probably the most or least impact way of fishing. Um, well, we would have to have the cameras running for the entire time we were fishing. And we're going to end up losing money costs, unless you're having amazing fishing. It means that we are, by the monitoring system that's supposed to be protecting um, the fishery, we're actually being forced to use a more intensive form of fishing. And long lining, well, certainly not the worst. In fact, a pretty good way to catch fish is more damaging to, you know, the, the, um, to the bottom, to the, to the uh, ecosystem and the environment than hand lining. So it's, uh, we're up against some legislation that's just really it's not out to get us, but it's, you know, it, it does throw some big hurdles in trying to do things in a more traditional way, you know, smaller scale. Um, anyway, that's, um, that's pretty much enough examples, but this is that type of thing that's making it uh, a little difficult to continue with our mission. Sean's much better at talking about that stuff than I am, so I'm glad he was here. <laughs> but you can see what we're talking about. There's a lot of these. Like you said, they're not out to get us. We're not conspiracy theorists. It's just that the system is designed for industrial scale fishing. And so um, sometimes people say, well, what's the big deal? Why don't you just go out and fish in traditional ways? Well, there's a lot of reasons why it's really difficult. There's a lot of challenges that we face. Um, and the last one up there is processing. And I have a picture here of, I mentioned our processor before. And this is Rumi Hokube. She's um, our processor. And um, that's her husband on the end who does the pin boning and then Richard and Taku, and they hand cut every fish that we sell to our, fish, to our CSF members, and um, everything is hand cut in the traditional Japanese way, and so it's really very high quality. It's um, very low loss, very very little fish is left on the bones. She's got the highest retention rate of any processor um, anywhere that we know of. But uh, Rumi is also uh, in the same kind of bind that we are, in that for her to secure a processing place is space is very challenging because it's a small crew. So this photograph was taken um, in uh, a plant in Richmond called High Toe Seafoods. She managed to lease a side room um, and then you know get it up to her standards and use it for this year. But High Toe, we'll talk about that, she doesn't have the space anymore. <coughs> and this happens kind of year after year that she isn't, she loses her space for a lot of reasons out of her control. So um, that's just one of the major bottlenecks for independent small scale fishermen, not just us, but for all the independent fishermen. And so we're in the sort of business development plan stage of um, uh, developing our own small scale processing plant that would only meet the needs of independent fishermen and all of the fish would need to be ocean wise, so it's sustainable seafood. Um, so with any luck, in the next year or so, you'll hear about that plant actually opening and I think that that's something that we can do to really change uh, some of those challenges. Um, wanted to just briefly, I know we're running a little bit out of time, but I want to just briefly talk about what we might learn from Alaska. And, and again, maybe Sean will talk about this because I'm not the fisherman expert. And you guys, a lot of you here know a lot more about Alaskan regulations than we do. But we often look to Alaska and how things are different there. And maybe we can learn from them, but maybe the changes that we would need to make are kind of impossible given our constitution and things like that. But do you want to just talk briefly about those three points? Uh, okay, well, I mean, obviously the first one is, is pretty clear that um, in Alaska, of course, fisheries falling under state control um, and fishing, the fishing industry uh, constituting a much higher proportion of their state economy than, say, fishing does to the Canadian economy. I mean, in, in our circumstance, uh, uh, even even the largest issue of fishing, uh, as far as an electoral issue, might actually sway one riding, maybe Northern British Columbia. Whereas you can lose an election by by you know in in Alaska. So there's a lot more incentive to be responsive to the coastal communities. I mean, this goes, of course, to, to the founding of Canada. I mean, you know, the constitutional issue, 1867, fisheries was given federally, forestry given provincially, in a country that consisted of four tiny little colonies on the Atlantic. There was 
they were, there was no conception that this country might include a West Coast. Um, and so we're really dealing with a really outdated constitutional model in, in, in terms of uh, allocating control of the fisheries. But, I mean, that's, that's obviously beyond anything we're going to, to fix. Uh, ownership of, of licenses and quotas. Um, uh, I know people here know lots about quotas and have their, their own issues uh, and their own opinions. Uh, if you go into uh, eastern United States, they will often talk about how um, NOAA points to British Columbia's transferable quota system as, as a, a model of sustainability and, 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 um, and certainly there's, there's something to it, but the ability to have quotas owned by investors uh, for lease has driven the prices up. Uh, making it very difficult for anyone new to get into uh, to get into industry, um, you know, with five dollar lease prices for for halibut quota. Um, okay, that that per pound that's going to obviously um, affect the cost of halibut. The um, ability of young people, newer people, to get into fishing and sustainably do it if you don't already own and. Uh, although I don't know the statistics for for longliners, I know that you know the average age of a fisherman in British Columbia is slightly over 60. Um, so it's only going to be more corporate control as the as the independent hang, you know, holdouts are, are, uh, disappear. Um, and the fact that our our quota can be controlled by uh, large companies that do not themselves fish but lease it out means that the the price of buying halibut in British Columbia is uh, now about eighty dollars a pound. You'll never make that back. So um, in Alaska, it's between 30 and 40. So about half the price, and we're, we're selling to the same. They're selling to the same world markets. Um, fish farming, well, open pen fish farms. That's just an issue that's that's much bigger than. I mean, obviously Alaska has a moratorium on it. They believe that it's a detrimental practice. Um, so do I. Of course, there's many people that take uh, another. Well, I don't think anybody's saying that it's wonderful environmentally, but perhaps they consider that it's worth the, worth the costs. Um, I, Alaska takes a, a much different approach. I don't know how effective it is. I haven't had a time to look at the science. I know some people here are the experts on you know, the Alaska's experiments with salmon ranching as opposed to farming, where at least the mindset is if you're going to increase fish production, utilize the existing commercial fishing fleet as opposed to circumvent them. Um, so uh, I could take questions on, on that after um, sure. Tonya wraps sure, up yeah. if anybody has any, any more interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for sure I'll get to the Q&A because I don't think we'll want to talk about some of those issues. But um, that's a little bit about uh, kind of you know, what we do, what some of the challenges are that we face. And so just to conclude, you know, how can you be involved? <laughs> Did you think of that? <laughs> You can join if you're interested, if you're looking for a sustainable, reliable place to get seafood. We're taking members for 2015 now, so you can go to our website, check that out. We are also, uh, we'll soon be hiring for summer jobs. I don't know, anybody looking for a summer job? Um, <laughs> come talk to me afterwards. But there's lots of ways to get involved with what we're doing. We're also always talking with other uh, fishing communities and other fishermen to help to spread the CSF movement. So there's one on Vancouver Island. Um, there's a few other people who are sort of trying it out around here, but there's actually about 40 CSFs in North America now, and we're in touch with all of them. And every second year we have a CSF summit together with all the CSFs and just talk about issues, how we can work together. So it's a broader movement, it's not just our CSF, and if you're interested in being involved in that broader movement, I can definitely talk with you about that. So um, thank you very much, and we'll just take some questions. You know, this is going to sound really crazy, but have, have you guys thought about the possibility of uh, uh, going to visit Dan Nomura and ask him if he'd be willing to partner with you to do all some of these uh, offloading and so on? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. Dan Nomura? Dan, Dan's the president of Ken Fisco. Oh. And uh, he comes from a trolling family. And the are one of the oldest fishing families in, in BC. He understands the situation of people like you. And it might, you're not in competition with Ken Fisco, I'm a living guy. But well, it could be really good publicity for them to.
to work out a partnership arrangement with you that to deal with the processing space, uh, to deal with some of this offloading issues and so on like that, that it might just be good business for him to take that to that aspect, to Mr. Patterson. And, uh, it's, it's interesting to consider that um, because well, I haven't really had that many dealings. I mean, we have used um, extensively the Seal Cove Canfisco plant for offloading uh, in Prince Rupert. And um, there's, yeah, I don't think we're, con we're competition for Canfisco, really. I mean, we're aiming for, you know, the, our, our long range goal is 1% of, you know, BC Fish would be like, that would be big. But, um, and, and I don't know Mr. Nomura uh, myself. Yeah, um, be worth considering to see if they'd want to do it as, at, a, at a PR level, but there's been a history in the past of Canfisco and BC Packers and, and other, you know, and, and Nelson Brothers that they collectively owned they, surreptitiously. They the bad guys, right? Well, they have, um, in, uh, I've been talking with uh, Harold Steves, you probably know from, um, He's on yeah, I mean, City Council in Richmond, and well, Stevenson's named after his family, but uh, you know he was on the uh, Stevenson Harbor Authority, and he's tried various times over the past 40 years to start a small-scale fish processing for independence and and some of the bycatch from the trawlers and uh, et cetera. And uh, the last two times he's tried, he wants to try again now. But the last two times he's tried, they were actually shut down by Canfisco and BC Packers still because they um, took their seats on the, the Stevenson Harbor Authority and voted it down. They wanted no part of any independent mm. taking over. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant if I don't know the person, because um, there has been a case of, you know, there have been cases of, uh, no, you play with us or you know, your own thing. Um, obviously, there's reasonable people within most most uh, corporations, and I, you know, willing to do whatever whatever works. But uh, there's been a history of being shut down. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and the effort. It's nice to see people like you just dream about something and think, do it, just go do it. Yeah, that's nice. In fact, you are succeeding not only in terms of the numbers. I just took a new student uh, this year. Her PhD is actually on this. She's going to look at... Would that uh, be Alison? You know Alison, right? <laughs> Alison, yeah. Uh, so she's going to look at And one key question is, is this scalable? You have 40 of them in North America. Is this something that can take place in Asia, in Latin America, Africa? Yeah, I mean, I fully believe that it can, and that's one of the things that I'm hoping Allison can prove <coughs> with her research is, is um, just how scalable is the CSF model. I, I think it's highly scalable. I think that I dream of a world in which there are CSFs dotting every coastal community around the world, that people eat their local food. I mean, isn't that crazy, right? That you eat the fish that comes out of the ocean where you live? What? Right? And that's sort of what I dream. And I mean, I don't know, can we feed 7 billion people? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to get into major global food politics stuff, but I really think that there's enormous potential for the growth of the model. There's now CSFs in London, there's two in, two in the UK, um, there's one in Australia, there's, it's starting, you know, they're popping up around. So, I'd like to think so. Um, yeah, and I think it, it's something that probably can work in Japan as well. No. Uh, and, uh, my question was, uh, how do you set your price? Because uh, I know you, you, your goal is going to be what you get in the market, but you're not going to the market. So what determines how much you pay the fishermen and how much you charge the consumer? Uh, the consumer price, I mean, it's, it's based on what it costs to fish, largely, and then what, we, what the fishermen, what we think is a fair amount for the fishermen, and then tack on costs on top of that. Primarily, we do have to to take in some consideration of the market. Um, the CSF in Halifax, that was the second in Canada, has been struggling a little more because their their um, ground fish is priced about double of the local market, and so they, it's really stopped them from from growing and had a little little bit of trouble. One fisherman I know there has decided he has to go his own way and is actually giving it up, sort of switching to lobstering. Um, so we do take into consideration what the market price is, but it's, it's primarily based on the costs of fishing. That, it, that, that really about $3, $3.50 a pound we should, 
be, you know, we'll cover the costs of, say, salmon gill netting um, for a season. And then from there, we work to, to what our final price is. Um, <coughs> but there's always been a negotiation, like when I've dealt with um, new, a, a new um, product for the first time. A couple of years ago, we started carrying, you know, halibut that's caught by young fishermen that I've that known and known the family for a long time. And I just start with, well, what do you think's fair? How much do you think you need? And he said, well, I'm getting this much from the company. This is what my lease costs. How about this? And then I go to Sonia and say, okay, well, what are the members willing to pay if we're paying this much for it and we lose this much processing, this is the cost, this is what it's sort of the number comes out to. Then so, to this, this. And then, so what we have to do is we have to figure out, I mean, our, we have to cover all of our costs and I'm not going to have the same profit margin from every item. So I have to kind of look at the whole picture and say, you know, the costs of halibut are so high, but if I pass that all on to the consumer, we, it's, we have a problem there. So I need to find the margin maybe on pink salmon to help cover our costs. So that's why taking on other products has been helpful for that, so that we can continue to offer a stable price to our customers, pay a fair price to the fishermen, and kind of have it all balanced out so all of our costs are covered. Yeah, so it's then possible to include some of the point gain costs that you mentioned earlier. Um, because I think as a consumer, especially consumers that are conscious about sustainability and, and traceability, mm -hmm. they should be willing to pay for that extra cost of making sure what they eat is sustainable. Mm -hmm. So the monitoring cost that you mentioned, would it be possible to include that in the consumer? Make sure yeah. the consumers understand that you know the, the, the price reflects these additional costs that fishermen have yeah, to pay. Exactly. Sure. And a, and yeah, exactly. And a lot of what we do, being that you know, Sean and I were both high school teachers and Otto actually was a high school teacher as well. And we really believe in the power of education and then when people are informed and they understand, yeah. then yeah, they're willing to pay more. So when I've, we've surveyed our members about price and how price sensitive are they. And what it really comes down to, it's not that they don't care what things cost, but that if it seems fair and just yeah. and it's transparent and they understand why something costs what it does, then they're willing to pay a little bit more. So what our members say is, it's not important that our fish is cheaper than in the yeah. grocery store. It's important that the money goes to where it needs to go and that it's fair. So we have done that where we've said, okay, look, halibut's gone up 50 cents a pound for our members, this is why. And then there's, they're very happy to pay it. Yeah. So yeah, that is our price model, which is why if you go to our website to try to find prices, they're not there. Because I, and I, I don't want to put prices up because it's not like that. It's not like yeah, I'm exactly. the company I have this price. It's that, well, what's fair? And those things, like the monitoring costs, they come up very suddenly. Yeah. And so when we tell our members, look, we, what are our prices? Our prices are fair. That's what they are. You know, they are really, truly, and they're transparent. So. Well, I'd just like to add, you know, that's, that's prices, you know, how we, we do this. If we're, um, just give you an example of pricing, and this also goes into the larger companies as well. Um, pricing on the fishing grounds. Like if I go to Barkley Sound where I was fishing this year and I'm catching a lot of fish and then I'm also taking some fish from a couple of our other fishermen there. Actually there's only one other guy there. But uh, one week we were really short on fish and he just said, hey, I've got friends. They really like, you know, and, and they're guys I know. I'm like, sure, we'll, we'll take your fish. But we kind of have to keep quiet what the price is. Even though I would love to jump up and down and say, we're paying $3 a pound and all the companies have to do the same. Or, you know, it will at least will affect the price somewhat. And someday we may scale to the point that we will actually affect price a little bit. But um, there was one company came in, uh, they sent in a packer, an American company, large fishing company, sent in a packer and paid 25 cents a pound more than the other companies. I talked to the captain of that boat. Uh, he got phone calls uh, from and Fisco and a few other companies immediately, within a week. What are you doing? Why are you here paying more than the rest of us? Um, not overt threats, but like you're messing up the program. And then there was, they were starting to badmouth them. Oh, this company does this, this company does that. So it's really um, quite intense, the pressure to not pay more uh, on the ground to, to fishermen. Um, it's, it's an interesting industry. So we keep our heads down and we try to do what we're doing quietly. I, we haven't, the, um, the question, if you didn't hear, am I looking at the Gulf of Georgia as a sales site? We haven't, as of yet, there are some families working down there selling. Um, we haven't really ruled anything out. We're, I mean, we're primarily based out of Falls Creek, and then we hit the farmer's markets and do deliveries. Of course, we also have you know locations in Calgary and, and things, but we're looking at, uh, along with, with Harold, at the, uh, the Paramount site for possible processing where the fish auction was. That's right, yeah. But there's, there's a lot of uh, Steveson Harbor Authority buildings that were fish plants that 
there's now political will and enough people on the board that there's interest in getting that going for independent processing. Because it really is a bottleneck, and not just for us, for a lot of independents. I know people that call us up that say, you know, like, you know, they know what we're doing and say, hey, you know, I've got a load of fish and I really want to sell them, um, you know, independently myself. Do you know who's your processor? I'm like, ooh, she's really busy in there. Could you please introduce them? I'm like, oh, well, okay. And then we know somebody else, and it's like, well, here's this processor, but we can't tell too many people because then we don't have, I mean, it's, it's a real bottleneck. Okay, the reason I asked that question was because uh, they are considering putting together a committee, mm -hmm. which the best thing to sit on, uh, to have sales at the Gulf of Georgia County Center. Really? Mm -hmm. So I thought really? that the way that you were approaching it with uh, Steve's mm -hmm. No, I, he didn't mention anything about that. Yeah, yeah we'd be interested. We're and always Sarah, cautious. Sarah also uh, said so. We'd be happy to. We're always cautious not to encroach on different fishermen's mm -hmm. markets. So if there are steepston based fishermen who would feel that we were muscling in on their turf, we, we don't want to, I mean, there's plenty of room out there to sell fish from independent fishermen directly to consumers. And we don't want to put anybody out of business. Having said that, if there was an opportunity, we, we would have, be happy to well, do that they, if it didn't. The reason they're looking at it, they have so many uh, visitors, and uh, most of those visitors are interested in buying fresh uh, fish, as you well buying. We're, we're always looking for new areas you know, to connect with, with the consumer. I mean, we, uh, one thing that I'm very aware of is that I really haven't managed to, um, to make much inroads into the uh, Asian Canadian population. Like the, 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 rather, the newer generation, you know, Chinese population in Richmond, for instance. A few, definitely, but not, they don't know we exist. I don't know how to, how to, you know, to interact yet with that community. And that's a large you know, large population of, of people that eat Richmond, fish. Yeah, sure, in Richmond, and they're 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 seafood consumers, and uh, making that connection would be great as well. Uh, I had interest. I was I got a call recently. In fact, I need to call him back. Um, Vietnamese fisherman, second generation, who wants to do something along the lines of community supported fishing to help his community of fishermen and crabbers and his family get going. And we're going to have to see whether he's going to start his own or work with us or. or um, Right. Yeah. There's there's room for us to scale. I mean, it's um, as long as it you know is sustainable, works with with model of, of transparency, then uh, it's all go. A, a very quick one. How do you ensure that it's sustainable? It makes you sustainable. Yeah. Um, I mean, we well so, so far because we're not that huge, we know all the fishermen personally, mm -hmm. and we know how they're fishing, and we uh, can trust them personally because we know them. Um, but uh, on, a, on a bigger scale, how we provide assurance for our members is not just trust us, but that we use the ocean-wise standards. And so everything that we have is ocean-wise. And so sometimes we get people asking, for example, for shrimp. People really want local BC shrimp, but it's not ocean-wise. It's drag caught. And so we've, we weighed it out because we were like, well, drag caught BC shrimp is still better for people and the environment than Thai shrimp, which is what most of what you're going to get out there is. But it's still not our standards. So we just say, look, we can tell you where to get local BC shrimp. I'm happy to pass you on to somebody who will do it, but we won't take that on because that's that's our line in the sand is is what Ocean Wise recommends. So we wait for spot prawn season, on, on which we have no margin. Prices are just too high, but everybody wants it, and we're so we're happy. We're having play and then we do get five caught shrimp in the prawn trap, so trap shrimp. Then we'll have both shrimp available, but not drag caught. I think, think the other the other answer to that is is that everybody's using small enough scale equipment that you know sure it's possible to overfish in, in many ways but when you're doing it on a small scale it would take a long time and a lot of work to do it and you probably notice as it's happening um, you know like our, our tuna boat is well it's a tuna troller right when he comes in with a load of tuna it looks like a lot to me but then you know and so does our whole fleet when they're when they're trolling but you compare it with like the largest a uh, tuna company in the world has seven ships, and that's it, and the size of BC ferries, and they use a 1.5 kilometer long net to, to, to stain them uh, mid-ocean. Well, then you are working at a high enough capacity that you could be doing damage before you really catch it, and we're promoting the smaller scale, and promoting the people that have a vested interest in keeping this going. 
that they are multi-generational, that they're part of the community. Now that there is, really, we're not talking about your shareholder interest. We're talking about fishing as a way of life, and uh, those are the people we want to help keep, keep in it, my, myself included. I like the fact that I will fish until I choose not to, as opposed to being priced out. Massachusetts, and we've got a few CSFs out there. Um, we've had some CSFs that have done better than others, and, um, and it seems like the model that works for us is in situations where there's some existing infrastructure for the fishermen. You probably know the fisheries in infrastructure where I am is drying up, you know, it's disappearing. We don't really have much left. And so one of the family operations that started a CSF had their own shoreside facilities. They had their own private dock. Um, it was the Cape Cod CSF. It was the first one we had out there. That was actually part of the first delivery. It was kind of cool. But, um, and it, it worked for a few different reasons. They've got product there that they generally ship off Cape to Boston and New York, so they weren't competing too much with local markets. But one of the things we're struggling with to establish other CSFs is that you know, there's very few buyers left. Fishermen don't want to leave their buyers and fracture those relationships. Um, and there aren't many other options for them if they move to join a CSF or to start their own, there's often no going back. And, you know, I, I guess I'm wondering what you would say to those fishermen, because I do think it's a good model. Um, you know, we've tried to encourage them to explore partnerships with things on the, more on the agricultural side and other ways, but there's really no way to replace that lost infrastructure. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, that's obviously one of, one of our problems as well. Um, uh, I mean, partly what we're realizing is that we almost have to, to scale to provide some of the services I mean, that the, um, the fishing companies um, provided. Now, I know, for instance, Cape Cod, um, I don't know all the details of yours. I know that the very first CSF, the, the one that preceded us by a year, would be Port Clyde, Fresh Cash, and Maine, who started because the company shut down. Um, and they basically took it over and started. CSF to, to keep these guys going. Um, so, uh, I mean, for me, in, in some cases, I, I don't. We're not really replacing a fishing company that, you know, might go out of business. It's that here, anyway, we're almost we're irrelevant to those fishing companies. They've gone to a large to the same boats for their salmon that they own. We're not. You're not really depriving them of their fish. So we're not quite in the same same circumstance. There aren't the small processors anymore. We're really down to two or three here that work the whole coast. So it's not as um, regionally uh, um, stratified as it is on the East Coast where you have more regional fleets. Yeah, I know that the topic for the 2015 CSF Summit is processing. It's sort of the key that all of us are struggling with at the same time. And I think that speaks to what Sean was saying is that I think CSFs are kind of realizing that, um, you know, and, and we were super uncomfortable with this term scaling, you know, it's this kind of like... That's, that's when you to take the fish. No, that's fine, descaling your fish. <laughs> the idea of, right, like this idea of just getting bigger and bigger and people say to us, well, how do I know you're not just going to become the next big fish company that rips everybody off to? But what we've come to realize is that uh, if we want to stay around, then we have to grow because we have to be able to provide some of those services. I think the others, that's what we're looking. We're looking at CSFs that say, look, I just want to be me. I'm one person fishing my boat, my fish. These are my customers. That's it. I don't want anything to do with anything else. I don't think that's going to last. And yeah, I think we've seen that fail in a, in a few ways already. Yeah, we have. Yeah. And it, it, the other thing is, one of the things we've done out east is um, selling fish in the round, you know, we're selling whole fish in some cases, and that helps. But yeah. with specialty products like squid, I mean, I've, I've tried teaching people how to, how to clean squid, and some people think it's great, some people don't want anything to do with it. Right. Um, and again, that's the sort of education piece. I mean, yeah, some people are never going to want anything to do with it, but, you know, we do filleting workshops and canning workshops and smoking workshops. And yeah, the education part is, is big. Is a huge and we have an equipment library that members can take stuff home from, and we rent kitchens to do open kitchens. So like a big piece of it is that I think we have to be a groundswell. We have to be uh, like a community of people who are saying, we realize that if we want to keep our fish local and sustainable, that we all have to kind of be part of that. Right? So Although we could also take, we could also take some uh, um, cues from uh, Copper River, Copper River, Alaska, where, where even though they are shipping, um, shipping out, uh, they do cooperative processing 
for, for local. So, you know, Cape Cod community processing for the independents. More than one. More than one CSF could, you know, in fact, share a community, which is what we're looking at here. We're not looking at starting a processing, you know, Skipper Autumn's processing plant, but um, maybe, a, well, we're looking at different business models for it, but that could process for us and some of the other independents in the same same circumstance. And and I think with with the uh, the size of the fishing community that you've got in New England, I mean, to me, the distances seem so small. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's you're in Boston you're almost in New York by the time you get halfway up our coast, right, from, from that area, so. Um, but then the population's much different, but I mean, in Copper River, they sort of collectivized the, the processing. 